They all good day. Today is my 55th lecture under the banner of Marine Quest Solutions. So far, we have broadcast, we have been broadcasting quite a few series, be it on anchoring procedures, now on passage planning procedures. So, this is the part three. So far, I have divided the comprehensive passage planning into six parts so that. I can detail all the critical aspects of the passage planning and make my audience understand the criticality and the special operations which are required. Therefore, we begin with our lecture number 55, uh, Comprehensive Passage Planning Series Part 3 under the banner of Marine Quest Solutions. Please do like, subscribe. Uh, with the bell icon so you can get an update whenever we are uploading a new lecture. Thank you. So, so far we have uh, talked about in uh, part one, you know, all these aspects, parallel indexing, chart chain ranges and frequency and position fixing uh, methods and verification of positions, prominent navigational radar marks. Part 2, we had talked about no-go areas, landfall, targets and lights, clearing lines, transit heading marks and leading lines, and significant tides or currents. Today, what we are going to talk about is safe speed and necessary speed alterations, changes in, uh, in machinery status, uh, so machinery space and status, that is manned and unmanned, change in, uh, changes in machine, machinery status, that is standby or for maneuvering, and changes in the bridge watch level composition therefore we begin with our uh, this uh, 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 lecture of uh, for part 3 lecture number 55 so and these are the part 4 5 6 which I'll be broadcasting in due course of time so part 3 safe speed and necessary speed alterations changes in machinery status that is Manned, unmanned, changes in machinery status, that is standby for maneuvering, and changes in bridge watch composition. This is what we are going to talk about in today's lecture. Now, let's start with the kind of preamble to apprise us uh, on the subject matter. Safe speed, we know by rule number six. It has been talked about that every vessel shall at all time proceed at safe speed so that she can take an uh, proper and effective action and be stopped well within the distance to avoid any close quarter situation and or collision. We will talk about it in a chronological order as we go down. So safe speed having regard to the proximity of navigational hazards, wide coal wrecks, uh, rule number 6, maneuvering characteristics of the vessel and its draft in relation to available depth of water. Let me go through it then I will give a you know the whole sum, sum up of it. Uh, so. I repeat again, safe speed having regard of the proximity of navigational hazards while coal, uh, wide coal wreck uh, rule number 6, maneuvering characteristics, uh, characteristics of the vessel and its draft in uh, relation to available depth of water, required speed alterations such as where there may be limitations because of night passage, tidal streams or allowance for increase of wearing taking into a consideration of the vessel maneuvering characteristics any limitations imposed. Nav equipment, radar, main engine steering, uh, vessels, seaworthiness, weather constraints and stopping distance etc. Speed plan, the planned speed for the leg which will always be at or below the safe speed after considering the proximity of navigational hazards along the route, the depth of the water and the maneuvering characteristics of the vessel. Then last is roti, that is rate of turn indicator, can usually be entered by the rate of turn radius, which is normally also incorporated with the egg dust. So what I'm trying to talk about here on this particular slide is that the safe speed <coughs> has a lot of components, like a lot of things are involved in that. Many a times I have found during my own time as sailing and during audit inspections, I found many of our mariners are very much confused that what is the safe speed. Remember, the main mantra of ship handling is one is that we have fixed machinery and we have fixed 
uh, uh, you know, the, when we talk about the constants on board, we have machinery that is the main engine, then we have the steerage and small vessels, we have the bow thrusters. But the external factors are wind, sea, swell and current. The idea is how we can harmonize and take advantage of the external force in our favor. That is what is called or is the mantra of ship handling. So right now, today we are talking about, we'll be talking about all the aspects which diligently affects the mariner, be it towards the safety of navigation or exercising prudence towards the safety of navigation is concerned. Also, with respect to your PSC and wetting inspections. So that is the reason I have, this lecture will be a bit long enough because I've jotted down lots of points which may help to facilitate you. Last but not the least, Many are mariners, including masters, when we step on board, <coughs> before we have a bridge familiarization, we do not take the cognizance of a very important document, that is the ship's maneuvering capabilities or ship maneuvering characteristics, the poster which is posted on the bridge, which is IMO mandatory, uh, mandatory regulation. So, I urge all the mariners to please do have a look at it as far as the bridge maneuvering poster is concerned and try to uh, do read and understand the crux of the matter be it tactical diameter turning circle stopping distance lots of maneuvers which are carried out be it in loaded passage ballast passage with speed <coughs> turning to port or turning to starboard etc etc along with the bridge uh, bridge uh, visibility there are lots of factors which are incorporated as per bridge procedures guide also and it is a mandatory requirement as far as IMO is concerned. So, <coughs> going to the next page, <coughs> next slide, the points to, points to ponder. What I'm going to do first, I'm going to re uh, read the whole slide, then I'm going to talk about the salient features or important aspects. Points to ponder. At reduced speed, the external effects like wind, sea, swell currents, tidal streams enhances on vessel considerably. It becomes difficult many a times to maintain the vessel's head and head reach at a reduced speed. Now, when we talk about reduced speed, yes, it is always good to reduce the speed, but there is a myth that reduced speed is always safe speed. Not until such time your present existing safe speed can counter the weather effects, be it current, wind, sea, swell, because current is of course strong, it will push you, uh, you know, make you set to another side and you'll be deviating from your path or course. Wind, subject to the windage area, will also affect your vessel beat. Uh, if you are in loaded, the wind uh, windage effect will be less, but also depends upon superstructure. But in ballast, definitely uh, the effect will be by and large quite a bit. Due to the above effect, the vessel can set adversely, especially in the proximity of navigational hazards. Especially whilst approaching leaving anchorage, the assessment of the safe speed shall be taken into consideration by the master of the vessel in order not to set in the proximity of the other anchored vessels uh, in the vicinity and avoid close quarter situations and or during critical passages in the vicinity of hazards, that is the navigational hazards. Many accidents and incidents have taken place due to the mis misjudgment of masters as far as delineation of safety, uh, safe speed is concerned. In other words, the safe speed has not been construed well or properly with respect to the external forces which are acting upon the vessel. The other aspects which cannot be undermined are vessel squat, UKC bow and cushioning effect, suction effect, venturi effect, shall also be taken into account along with the practical knowledge of seamanship especially by the masters during the critical passage now as i spoke earlier that the mantra of uh ship handling starts with the you know uh, when you harmonize the external and internal factors as far as the ship handling is concerned over and above how do you maneuver the vessel under the given circumstances of strong external forces to maintain your coastline? That is how you need to maneuver or you need to adjust your speed. The next point I talked about was uh, regarding anchoring. When the vessels are approaching anchor, they are at reduced speed and many a times the 
masters or the vessels which are proceeding towards anchorage they make a mistake coming in the close proximity and trying to cross the bow of an anchored vessel when i say bow of the anchored vessel means the vessel which is already anchored is of course stemming the tide uh, or stemming the current or the wind effect whichever is the greater or may fall into the resultant so when you're trying to cross the bow of her you're going to set more towards her so the safest thing when you are at reduced speed proceeding towards your last or final leg of anchorage try to pass a stern of the anchorage vessel anchored vessel as far as practically feasible then uh, the other aspects which uh, i talked about the squat ukc bow cushioning effect suction effect this is all because of the restricted water effect which i have already broadcast a detailed lecture on my on ukc explaining all the you know things which affect the vessel's maneuverability as far as the uk squat and the ukc is concerned and of course while traveling uh, traversing through the critical passages uh, the speed has to be in control the main engines are on standby so that is at master's discretion what speed he wants to adjust the vessel to because you're always at maneuvering uh, rpm now rule 6 <coughs> now we talk about rule 6 safe speed interpretation now i've tried to interpret uh, this rule as far as practically feasible with respect to my practical and pragmatic experience with practical knowledge of the seamanship every vessel shall at all time proceed at safe speed so that she can take proper and effective action to avoid collision and be stopped within a distance appropriate to the prevailing circumstances and conditions and determining a safe speed the following factors shall be among those taken into account now when we talk about the safe speed first i have just try to explain you know again a preamble prior to going by, uh, going down the rung with rule number 6 safe speed meaning many a times it is construed ambiguously and that's what i meant any vessel making way through the water has to maintain speed in order to avoid close quarter situation with other vessels if the speed is too low and the current effect is strong she may drift towards the other vessel which is what we just said therefore the slow uh, slow speed steaming in the proximity of strong current may lead to a catastrophic situation however if the vessel is traversing at a higher speed and if in case of any eventuality like steering failure she would automatically have resulted into a deviation from her path and may run into danger with respect to her maneuvering characteristics as far as her stopping distance and turning circle tactical diameter and emergency contingency measures are concerned so in first case low speed can also result into a coming into close quarter situation at the same time conversely speaking high speed can also be not very favorable in case you have a steering failure or any other malfunction of the machinery or equipment therefore the speed has to be decided by the master it is at his jurisdiction while traveling through traversing through the critical passage the myth of safe speed like you know proceeding at a very slow speed that you can hardly make a head reach is also not correct when the adverse effects of current sea swell wind are very strong hence safe speed means the ship making way through the water at a speed at which it if in case of any emergency master should be able to anticipate her stopping distance and emergency maneuvers well within uh, well in advance in order to avoid a close quarter situation and the risk of collision that is how it is so of course we know there are many steps between cup and lip but this is how it is how it should be construed and understood very well by the master that what is the safe speed in one particular passage and that is how the speed what is what speed you are going to decide has also be you know mentioned into the passage plan for each and every leg and that is the reason it is important to do the bridge team passage plan meeting prior to commencement of the passage where you where the master is there all the navigators are there and chief and second engineer is also there are there also there so that everybody has understood the plan of action prior to commencement of the passage 
In open sea, main engine slowdown or stopping may not be required and a maneuver uh, in good time well before closing in would be an appropriate action. However, if traversing through a critical passages, narrow channels where the constraints imposed by channel depth, you can see uh, uh, then the main engine has to be uh, kept on standby mode. So when you are traversing through a critical passage, it's obviously the engine room is, uh, you know, be it an UMS class vessel. She also has to be manned, two generators to be running, all the auxiliaries running to support the propulsion. And in any case of any eventuality, the speed can be controlled, reduced and increased again once the danger is clear. That is what it means. So, uh, now where the constraints imposed by the UKC channel depth, uh, the then the main en engine should be on standby mode, that is because of squat and UKC constraints. In case of if any strong current or poor visibility, then in open sea, uh, the main engine may be required on maneuvering refs in order to have more time for assessment of situation and take appropriate action. So idea is when you are at high speed, you reduce it. What you are trying to do, you are giving yourself more time for the assessment. At a higher speed, you, the time limit or the CPA time reduces drastically but when you reduce the CP uh, the TCPA increases therefore you have more time to explore the option and assess carry out your fair and final assessments by all vessels that is uh, point number one for white rule number six state of visibility the visibility if the visibility is affected by any condition then the adequate precaution shall be taken into account along with the main engine as far as exercising due diligence and prudence towards the safety of navigation is concerned. The vessel shall be on hand steering with both steering motors running and posting of an extra lookout that is in case of reduced visibility, fog horn for the respective vas vessel, white coal wrecks like for a power driven vessel making way through the water, the fog signal is uh, at an interval of not more than two minutes, one prolonged blast. And the radar should be well, uh, should be tuned well for optimum signal strength as for, uh, as well as scanning at lower ranges as appropriate. So, in case of restricted visibility, all the measures, even in fact, all the companies have the SMS checklist shall be complied with over and above the practical knowledge of seamanship. Uh, when we talk about you know the uh, optimized usage of the radar and uh, tuning of radar scanning the radar uh, radar uh, at lower uh, ranges keeping the steering motors both the steering motors running uh, main engine standby posting extra lookout vessel on hand steering all these things shall be carried out point number two the traffic density including concentration of fishing uh, fishing vessels or any other vessels if the vessel is navigating in high traffic density area with lots of vessels which are in the close proximity, the vessel has to be manned on or and on standby. That is the main engine. Own vessel shall be prepared for any emergency contingency measure in order to avoid eventuality. The alteration of courses may not be possible due to high traffic density area or the restricted waters, whichever the case may be. In that case, alteration of speed is the best possible action. Once you're in the restricted waters with high traffic density, of course, you may not have enough sea room to alter, the, uh, to alter courses all the time. The best possible action is to reduce speed. If there's a vessel which is passing ahead of her, let her pass ahead of her. Uh, let's say if she's on the starboard side, you instead of altering because you may not have sufficient sea room, to alter and pass clear of her going astern of her in that case you must reduce speed let her pass ahead of her in a crossing situation i'm just giving an example high traffic density fishing vessels could be a menace especially during the coastal passage prudence towards the safety of navigation shall be exercised without a fail nowadays uh, many uh, accidents are taking place due to marinous complacency Nowadays, what is happening that I see lots of reports, do a lot of incident investigations. There have been a lot of collisions with the fishing vessels besides the regular traffic. I understand like things have changed a lot geopolitically. Like 
it is actually honestly speaking when we say for example talk about the taiwan straits it is almost forbidden to traverse from the west of taiwan it's always uh, you know advisable to go east of taiwan when you're passing taiwan but today in that area also humongous fishing traffic is there and many a times these fishing boats they don't follow the ror they just go but then when we talk about the responsibility of the vessels we have to give a safe passage to them therefore under these circumstances if the cluster or clutter of fishing vessel is which is obstructing your passage best thing for duty officer is to call master and master should man the engine room reduce speed and maneuver the vessel safely to avoid any close quarter situation and or collision and let's not be complacent that we are at high speed we'll pass clear that is what it is that is where lots of things are happening many a times due to the size of the fishing vessel it may not paint on the radar due to smaller cross section of the target until such time it is scanned at lower range scales and with properly tuned radar now let's talk about the fishing vessel fishing vessel has mainly the most of the structure is made up of wood and some of the metal is also there so what is happening when the radar rays are you know uh, coming and uh, 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 touching the target let's say fishing vessel or getting home on to the fishing vessel most of them are absorbed so the signal which is going back to the scanner through the wave guide and through the radar processor is very weak so sometimes it, it may not be picked up and that is where a proper tuning of the radar is very much important which i am very sorry to say that today many of our officers have seen they are not well versed even with the tuning of radars another thing i'd like to put across today we have state of the art equipment on on the bridge ecdis gps dgps ais all the electronic gadgets ais and everything but still lots of accidents and collisions are taking place what i recall few factors among them number 1 is the duty officer or the masters they are not well versed with the limitations of the electronic aids to navigation number 2 over reliance upon the electronic aids to navigation number 3 not having the practical knowledge of seamanship because of the over reliance upon the electronic aids to navigation and that is what has been the main cause of concern you pick up any accident incident investigation report where the collisions have taken place because of the lapses of master or their <coughs> initiative judgment or the action what they have taken has always been governed by the electronic uh aids to navigation they don't use the human factor remember be it ecdis uh, or any of the electronic gadgets they are basically something like in a layman's terminology they are computers and this brain is the one which made the computer so why don't we rely upon this brain and these are our natural radars of course we have to use our radars in the restricted visibility but the eye and the brain coordination is the best and with the knowledge and skills this is what it is <coughs> the maneuverability of the vessel with special reference to the stopping distance and turning ability in the preva prevailing conditions this relates to the peculiar peculiar maneuvering characteristics of the different vessels a large fully laden tanker may have stopped her engines after being on full ahead that is if she makes an emergency stop by exercising an emergency full stern but the momentum of the vessel that is mass into velocity is such that she would come to a complete halt conditions only after traversing considerable considerable amount of distance respectively now what does it say that a big laden tank of vlc vlcc or a suez or afra i've been i had been commanding vlcc suez afra all types of tankers i can share with you when a vlcc is at almost speed of 2 to 3 knots and you want to stop her you may have to a laden vlcc i'm talking about you may have to go maybe something like half a stern to basically stop her mom momentum why because it's a very heavy mass because she is laden tanker and the velocity so to break it down you may have to go for a you know considerable amount of stern thrust 
to basically put a, put your brakes on. Whereas a smaller cargo vessel or a same tanker in ballast in such conditions may have stopped in water at a distance of lesser with respect to laden condition of a VLCC, that is the stopping distance. In both cases, besides the vessel's maneuvering characteristics, the windage area of the respective vessel shall also not to be undermined. Therefore, it is imperative for mariners to have a proper understanding of the vessel's maneuvering characteristics with respect to the poster on the bridge. Now, that is also very important because at the beginning of the lecture, I did say that many of our mariners do not pay heed to this. This is also equally important that it should be all the instructions on that, even diagrammatic pictorial things should be read and understood and conceived properly. So, I've given two examples for a VLCC. When you are stopping her at a slow speed, you may have to go for a very strong stern thrust because of the mass into velocity. A VLCC laden will have a less windage area, whereas a ballast VLCC will have more windage area and accordingly wind effect will be more stronger. But in case of a small tanker, the things are a bit different because she, the mass into velocity is lesser with respect to VLCC. So may, you may need lesser uh, st stern thrust to stop the vessel. I have shown a bit of a, you know, a diagram which I have taken from a few places. A vessel which is trying to turn to starboard, this is the advance by such time she comes to an angle 90 degrees to her original course and the distance traversed travers from this point to this point is tactical diameter until such time she comes on almost reciprocal course and then the, uh, the path of midship point or the drift angle which is over here how she is going to drift and rudder angle uh, like uh, was fully executed here. So basically idea is that the whole thing which has been uh, you know the ship's maneuvering characteristics have been tried and tested by the shipyard prior to delivery all the parameters have been taken into consideration in cognizance of that particular vessel by the shipyard and by the experts who, who do the maneuver, uh, maneuverability trial and test of the vessel which is a mandatory requirement by under IMO. The second pictorial thing is <coughs> shown with a normal loaded condition with maximum rudder angle when one when the vessel is turning to port second when the vessel is turning to starboard again the advance in this case is uh, 0 decimal 388 nautical miles and this is your uh, you know tactical diameter same thing is over here in case of uh, turning to port the advance is 0.388 nautical miles turning to starboard advance is 0.373 nautical miles and the transfer uh, sorry, the transfer in this case is 0 0.41 turning to port and to starboard is 0.54. So idea is, I request all the mariners to do have a look at your ship's maneuvering characteristics diagram. Now, in case you all want me to explain in detail about the ship maneuvering characteristics with respect to diagram, I can do that. But that is a separate lecture. But in this case, I had to include two pictures just to show you the importance of it. This is not all. The, the, this whole subject of ship's maneuvering characteristics diagram will take another two or three lectures to explain you all completely. So you will understand the importance of it. However, as we speak, this particular subject matter is on the passage planning. So I won't deviate from the you know, original course. I have just shown you the importance of it. Please do have a look at it in case you want me to broadcast <coughs> a separate lecture on, uh, you know, ship's maneuvering characteristics, uh, characteristics. I'll do that for you. Now, at night, the presence of background lights such as from shore lights or from the back scatter of our own lights. Now, this is also equally important aspect when we talk about uh, the back scatter of the light especially at night we'll show you what has happened like you know the above fact refers to state of visibility especially whilst vessel is departing a port at night and is surrounded by bright lights from shore in the vicinity and her navigation lights may be cluttered or camouflaged 
a lookout on the vessel hence may not be able to distinguish while departing the port until she comes to a position where the background lights are out of the visible range. We must have seen arriving, making port approaches or departing port when we are in the close proximity of the lights. They sometimes make you blind or in case the visibility is becoming bad, the back scatter of it many times confuses the navigator. The idea is that the cognizance of this particular point why rule number six shall also be taken into account. An example I've shown you that when the vessel is departing the port, the, 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 the cluttered light which are from port, which are very bright, may confuse and even camouflage your own navigational lights as well and even the other vessel's light also. You or the lookout may realize when you're coming in the close proximity. However, there you have to use the radar to use your judgment and ARPA and take actions accordingly. But the idea is visual thing is must, but in case you're getting obscure uh, with your vis uh, vis uh, vision because of the backscatter of the lights, you have to, you know, accordingly be uh, judicious enough to take the right action. The second case refers to the backscatter of, uh, of vessel's own light, especially whilst a vessel is entering into a patch of restricted visibility. This is an important fact when I asked, uh, you know, interviewing many uh, candidates. That if you are in open ocean passage, it's a overcast night, pitch dark night, overcast sky, no moonlight, and you don't have any target until 96, uh, 96 nautical miles, that is, of the radar scanning range. How would you ascertain that you're entering into a patch of restricted visibility? The answer is the backscatter of your own navigation light, the mast headlights. That is the first indication that you'll get to know that yes, you're entering into a patch of restricted visibility. Backscatter of vessel's light is due to the effect of a brightly lit ship, say at anchor or at sea while the bridge uh, front portholes are not covered. This is one aspect. The light which emanates from these sources pick up the microscopic particles of atmosphere and they are seen as a filter to observer's vision. In cases where this filter is bright, it may obscure a distant vessel navigation lights and a lookout may detect the vessel when, observe, uh, when she observes that, uh, that in a very close proximity which can lead to a close quarter situation. Let me read the whole thing again. In case where, the, where this filter of, is bright, it may obscure a distance vessel navigation light and a lookout may detect the vessel when, the, when she observed that, uh, that in the very close proximity which can lead to a close quarter situation. So idea is that the backscatter of light can sometimes confuse you many a times so you have to anticipate in advance in order not to land up in a close quarter situation. The, sit, uh, the state of wind, seas, uh, wind, sea, current and the proximity of navigational hazards. This fact of matter highlights the vessel's windage area, her maneuverability, effectiveness of her steering, capabilities with respect to maneuvering capabilities along with the following factors as stated in point 6. So idea is that the wind, sea, swell, current, we have already talked about how it hampers the vessel's maneuverability especially at slow speed. Even at high speed, in case something goes wrong, you will have to again fall back to the slow speed. So, one has to be very, you know, careful what speed is to be taken into consideration well, while traversing one particular passage. Of course, it is at master's discretion. Draft in uh, uh, relation to the available depth of water, that is block coefficient, squat, UKC calculation, whether laden or in ballast, mass into velocity, which we talked about in the previous uh, slide. St her stopping distance, turning circle, transfer and advance, all these data you will be able to get from the ship's maneuvering characteristics. And <coughs> as I reiterated earlier, I have already broadcast a lengthy lecture worth 53 plus minutes on squat and UKC calculations, which will give you the whole sum up of what you would want to know. Then the last but not the least uh, point on this uh, slide, main engine rating that is percentage ahead with respect to a stern, that is the stern thrust. 
Many of you guys must have noticed that when the pilot comes on board, he may ask master, okay, captain, how much is your stern thrust? Is it 30 percent, 40 percent, 50 percent, whatever it is. There's a provision that it should also be mentioned in the pilot data check, uh, checklist card. What it means that, you know, if suppose your engine rated speed is 12 knots on a head moment, uh, motion on full ahead, not C speed, but full ahead maneuvering. Then if I say the stern thrust is 30 percent, that means if I go on full stern thrust, my stern speed may be around four plus knots approximately, around four plus knots. So it's around 40 percent approximately. So that is the meaning of main engine rating with respect to stern thrust. I found many mariners were very ignorant when the pilot asked them and with due respect without prejudice masters also were not in cognizance and forget about masters even the chief engineer when I asked them they also had to start looking at the manual at that point in time even when they were on board for you know quite handsome amount of time uh, as per their contract. Additionally, by vessels with operational radar, when it is stated that the vessel has an operational radar, it implies that the radar is fully functional and may be used to keep the radar watch. However, a proper lookout wide rule number five can never be undermined. Number one is the operational radar that we should know the limitation, including spurious echo. Even this is mentioned in ROR. Or spurious observations by radar. But also, wide rule number five, every vessel shall at all time maintain a proper lookout by sight, hearing as well as by all available means appropriate to the prevailing circumstances so that she can make a full appraisal of situation and the risk of collision. You know, because of this over-reliance on the electronic aids for navigation, when I had been doing a lot of mentoring uh, session for navigators worldwide on virtual platform, Sometimes I've asked many senior officers also that, okay, what is your primary means of lookout? And the answer I got was, sir, egg disc. I mean to say this was ridiculously way beyond what I ever expected. So, ladies and gentlemen, please, today we have everything, state-of-the-art equipment on board, navigation point of view. But we cannot forget our practical knowledge of seamanship, our instinct, and our capabilities and skills you, we need to harmonize this along with the electronic aids to navigation and you'll find the results are automatically optimized the characteristics efficiency and limitations of radar equipment a functional radar may not be operating at its peak performance maybe due to the magnetron has outlived its span or other uh, or the center of PPI is burnt out or any other uh, cause where excuse me, radar has got peculiarities which are readily apparent to a new observer but may be overlooked by old staff. The mast and the funnel cast radar shadows and for a particular ship blind sectors the watchkeeper have to take uh, that also into consideration and Performance monitor PM checks shall be carried out each watch and the read, uh, readings to be logged after comparing same as per the radar manual Now you see radar Of course is equipment Sometimes what happens the radar tuning is not coming up to the required limit so that means the first indication may be something wrong with the magnet rod so when we are talking about any of the man navigational equipment we must know and or should have the knowledge of that equipment that what are the limitations in case the radar is not performing to its maximum efficiency the first thing which come across our mind that okay maybe the magnetron has to be changed because that is the reason the echoes are not, are not painting properly on the radar the second point is you know, uh, of course, the blind sector, every radar has a blind sector because of the funnel or mast at the rear, which will construe a blind sector and it's a mandatory requirement to put the blind sectors on each respective radar after they have been verified. 
and third last but not the least performance monitor checks shall be carried out by all the watch keepers and tallied with the uh, radar manual that how much deterioration is there and last but not the least because when you use the gain too much of course now the the before it used to be CRT now it's a different uh, thing what we have but this particular thing also shall not be undermined any constraints next point any constraints <coughs> imposed by radar range scale that is spurious radar info sometimes a radar may be fully operational and good but it may have <coughs> a defect hence alternatively both 3 and 10 centimeter radars are to be used for long range scanning that is alternatively 3 centimeter radar gives you a fine picture coarse picture uh, and 10 centimeter is very good for long range scanning where the painting of the target is a bit bigger so we need to optimize the usage of it subject to which terrain we are in and we should also be able to identify the spurious echoes like for instance if you are coming in the vicinity or your radar has picked up a fishing target and uh, let's say that the painting is pretty clear but sometimes you get multiple targets also especially when two ships are passing close to each other there is interference of radar rays you find multiple echoes so idea is the limitation of radar the spurious info shall be also taken into consideration basically you need to filter out what is the exact thing what you're getting the picture on your ppi the effect of radar detection of sea state weather and sources of interference clutter a nuisance especially when it is least expected rain clutter is uh, is the raindrop sending their reflection back to observer who is more interested in detect detecting the ships rain clutter may completely obscure and suppress the echoes over the entire region of horizon and on radar thus any ships within that particular region may not be detected increasing the rain clutter control on radar will reduce the rain clutter will, will not only reduce the rain clutter but but will also obliterate the weak signals so rain clutter we use when we are uh, you know in the vicinity of low clouds or very heavy rain showers yes it is to be used judiciously but at the same time do take a note of it that rain clutter drastically suppresses the echo of the target we have two main rays from the radar one is hbw horizontal bandwidth the second is vertical bandwidth so what it does it suppresses the horizontal and vertical bandwidths and you start losing out the paint or the echo of the radar on your ppi so rain clutter is to be used judiciously many a time have uh, times i've seen when i go up on the walk up on the bridge beautiful clear visibility and i find duty officers use c clutter okay c clutter is to be used only just to suppress the echo uh, you know um, in the center of ppi but i find him using maximum amount of rain clutter for what i don't understand the reason is that not having a complete appraisal and the limitation of the equipment used and not having that knowledge and for that you must study uh, read the manual for each and every equipment what you're using on the bridge so you know how to optimize the usage and what are the limitations of this electronic uh, equipment navigational equipment uh, possibility that small uh, vessels eyes and f other floating objects may not be detected by radar at an adequate range of course that uh, small vessels may not be detected very clearly until such time it comes at a slow range uh, at a lower range icebergs or ice patches may not also be equally detected because they absorb the radiation which is coming from the radar and small floating object objects subject to the sea state may also not be picked up at radar at a considerable amount of range you may perhaps pick up when you are coming at closer range and therefore it is necessary to keep on changing the range if you, you have any doubt switch over from 10 to 3 centimeter 3 to 10 centimeter and keep changing varying the range just to identify if there is a target object or is it a fake or a spurious echo that is very important 
and there are a lot of radar techniques which you can use. The number, location and the movement of vessels detected by radar. Now, if in case you are in a very high traffic density area, let's say traffic, high traffic density area, what I would do, I'll keep one radar maybe on 12 nautical miles if the visibility, everything is good. And the other one is at 6 nautical miles. So I'm tracking on 12 nautical miles the targets which are uh, in the vicinity of 12 nautical miles which may cause me concern and on 6 nautical miles I am also monitoring the targets or uh, targets which are going to cause me an immediate concern. So I have got a complete appraisal. That is what it means. That is how you can optimize the usage of your radars. The more exact assessment of the visibility that may be possible when the radar is used to determine the range of vessel or the object in the vicinity. Now, in case the visibility is deteriorating and you need to know that how much is approximate visibility, of course, with practical knowledge of seamanship, you can say approximately this much, but you want to have exact assessment. If you have a target, you just see her visually by with Benox and see if you can see her clearly and then take a range, you get approximate range of visibility that what is the uh, visibility now. That is what actually this means. So there are a lot of other, uh, what I said earlier, radar techniques, how you can, how, techniques, how you can use it in your favor as far as the practical knowledge of the seamanship is concerned. Now next is change in the machinery spaces status and uh, manned, unmanned and change in the machinery status that is standby or maneuvering, for maneuvering. Now, because these both uh, points, they complement each other, so I have combined them together. First and foremost is of the UMS rounds. Nowadays, I think all the vessels are class UMS. So what all are the requirements? The high risk things I've touched over here, which may help to facilitate you, the DDO officer, and as well as duty engineer that when we are taking the safety rounds or night rounds by the duty engineer first and foremost it shall not be single single person entering an ums space is completely forbidden so safety precautions for unmanned machinery spaces for a daily routine check uh, routine rounds or checks prior to entry into the unmanned spaces that is un uh, engine room uh, unmanned spaces the duty engineer along with the motorman and or other another engine room rating shall notify the bridge prior to entry. The duty engineer engine room rating shall be properly attired with the respective PPE and as per their PPE matrix. The duty officer on the bridge to make an entry of the timings according to the deck, uh, accordingly in the deck log, uh, deck log book of the time of entry of the duty engineer and the motorman or the engine rating as well as at the time uh, the mode uh, is changed from UMS to man mode by the duty engineer. Of course, that will also be replicated in the data logger. Single person entry is for completely forbidden in an unattended engine room machinery space, especially for night rounds or uh, for checking or routine checking. Carry out UHF radios. Now, when I say UHF radio, because UHF radios uh, break the barrier of the steel which is a uh, steel structure which, which is between bridge and the engine room and that is the reason you must have noticed that many a times that between bridge and the engine room somewhere around monkey island or on the bridge wing you find another antenna is fixed up that is for uhf antenna and that is the reason it is mandatory for uh, the vessels which are classed with ums shall be provided with a uhf radios for engine room purpose so that the bridge and engine room shall have a proper communication in other words the duty officer will also have a uhf radio and same will be carried by the duty engineer upon entry a notification to the bridge where the uhf radio shall be given that is prior to entry when the duty engineer leaves the accommodation into the engine room whilst in engine room machinery spaces the dead man alarms to be acknowledged at an interval not exceeding 15 minutes along with regular reporting by duty engineer to be, uh, to be diligently carried out. Now, we have the dead men uh, alarms located at various places in the engine room and as per the requirement, the time limit shall not be more than 15 minutes. If the duty engineer forgets to acknowledge the dead men alarm, it will trigger a, uh, the engineer's call. And if the engineer's call, let's say, hypothetically is not ordered, it will trigger the alarm on the bridge. So, 
these are the safety measures which are being installed on the UMS machinery spaces and shall be abided to. Number one. And number two, like, you know, that recalls me when I, you know, I'd been sailing with quite a few oil majors at their, you know, quite some time back. They had a mercury switch. That means as long as the person who's entering the engine room spaces is vertical, there'll be no alarm. The moment he bends towards a certain angle, the mercury switch will trigger the engineer's call. So that was, uh, uh, that, that's a technological advance I'm talking about. In case of any uh, small job, permit to work system shall be strictly adhered to in concurrence with the master and the chief engineer. So uh, first and foremost at night uh, or during deck rounds, no work is to be carried out. But if some urgent work to be carried out, it shall be in concurrence with the master and chief engineer and uh, with the, uh, along with the you know, detailed risk assessment which shall be carried out. All safety precautions of the machinery spaces shall be strictly adhered to including auto start of the machinery spaces because many machineries they start automatically. Upon completion of UMS rounds, the duty engineer along with the engine room rating shall notify the bridge prior to leaving engine room by changing over the control back to UMS mode. Finally, upon entering into the accommodation, same as to be logged in by the duty officer on the bridge and in the deck log book. In other words, when the <coughs> duty engineer and the motorman or the engine rating has completed their round when they're exiting the engine room spaces and they've entered into the accommodation they must give a final check over the radio or over the phone that okay they've entered the accommodation spaces that means the duty officer is aware that okay uh, uh, the guys who had gone into the engine room they're all clear and then he makes a log entry and that's it that is a complete uh, conclusion of the whole uh, you know uh, the safety rounds and checks for the duty engineer takes at night. On a ship certified with the UMS operation, the machinery spaces may be unattended for a maximum period of 16 consecutive hours. No vessel is to operate with the machinery spaces unmanned in the following circumstances. At all times, the UMS checklist and the company as well as the chief engineer standing orders shall be complied with in concurrence with the master's acknowledgement. So, there are some exemptions under which the, even the vessel which is classed as uh, UMS shall not enter into the mode of UMS. What all are those conditions? We'll talk about that. During preparations for departure, main engine shall be in readiness, including the steering gear system. That is, during preparation of departure, of course, the engine room has to be kept manned. During maneuvering and standby operations, at sea or at anchor, when the master or the chief engineer requires the engine room to be manned due to adverse weather and or the traffic, etc. When the cargo handling plant places a high and val variable load on the electrical or steam generating plant, in case the load is high on the generators or you know steam plants subject to heating of cargo, especially on tankers, chemical tankers, under those circumstances also the the uh, engine room shall be kept manned because at that point in time maybe the uh, vessel is sailing and the heating of the cargo is carrying uh, is being carried out but if there is too much f of fluctuation subject to load under those circumstances the engine room also shall be kept manned even though uh, e even though if she's UMS class and the entry has to be <coughs> along with that made into the engine lock when port regulations prohib prohibit any unmanned uh, machine uh, engine room uh, operations that is when port regulations prohibit any unmanned engine room that is port authorities do not agree with the engine room keeping uh, being kept unmanned when the vessel is in their facility that also has to be complied with as per the port authority or port control uh, legislation with any fire major alarm or safety system inoperative including any fire detection system zones isolated now here remember if there's a problem with the fire uh, zone if it has to be isolated first and foremost the approval has to be granted by the master and if the master has granted the approval then the engine room has to be kept manned until such time the rectification of that fire zone loop which has been isolated has been completely conclusively carried out not until then the engine room shall ever be kept unmanned. 
if any propulsion equipment back uh, backup provision is inoperative that is any propulsion system is inoperative with any major control or communication system inoperative that is any major control system is inoperative and if the bridge control is inoperative that is the bridge control for ums is inoperative even then also the engine room also has to be kept manned before the chief engineer specific instructions for operating in unmanned condition have been complied with so <coughs> chief engineer special explicit instruction shall also be complied with it and if in his fairness and opinion and professional opinion for some reason if the engine room has to be kept man it shall be kept man and in, in cognizance with the master any malfunction of the critical machinery now other point which is important the minimum critical spare shall be uh, shall at all times be in order and sufficient on board as per the class requirements class gives a certification for ums class and lots of other things all over on, uh, on the ship but you know the pms program says that okay there should be this much of critical machinery spares many times they are not complied with it and what happens finally that if you have a failure of one of the critical machinery prior to that the engine room was kept ums class uh, unmanned but because failure of some critical machinery and for which the critical spare inventory inventory has not been maintained obviously you'll go back to the uh, to keep uh, for keeping the engine room manned now this is uh, next is changes in the bridge wash level composition this is a example what i've taken you can see for yourself but the salient features i'll talk about here is <coughs> the master shall review each leg of the passage plan and accordingly designate the bridge wash level this is done initially prior to the commencement of the passage the second mate marks bridge wash level 1 2 and 3 or 3 whatever it is but master being the most experienced person on the deck or uh, the navigating side shall amend review and amend the bridge wash level accordingly and this is to be discussed prior to commencement of the passage during the initial passage plan meeting by master and all the navigating officers including chief and second engineer all above shall be in strict compliance and adherence with the mandatory conventions that is solas marpol stcw convention and the company's environmental protection policy so the cognizance of all these shall be taken into account whenever you are deciding or the master is deciding the bridge watch level 1 2 or 3 respectively whatever he is doing now this is example of uh, you know conning uh, position that is bridge watch level 1 2 and 3 and uh, watch level 1 watch officer and ab and lookout is there bridge watch level 2 master chief officer watch keeper master or the chief officer because ma the chief officer suffices for master for maintaining work rest hours then additional watch keeper ab and a lookout bridge watch level 3 master watch officer 1 watch officer 2 ab and the lookout now this which i have you know highlighted with red is during the critical passage and in open passage this is it but in case of master's opinion he can always increase the watch level in the open sea for whatever the reason he may find it is uh, important or if he deems it necessary during raising of the bridge watch level master and the management level officers shall ensure there should not be any breach of rest hours requirement for all officers and ratings respectively so idea is that <coughs> prior to coming because this initial passage plan meeting is carried out so march has already delineated bridge watch level 1 2 3 and let's say one or two days prior to the critical passage the master should instruct the hod's head of departments that okay we are going to go into the critical passage deck and engine room because engine room may also be kept manned and the deck uh, watch level has to be enhanced so the respective person shall be compensated in advance for the rest hours so there is no breach of work rest hours that's what it means uh, as per ilo as an sccw uh, convention it should be minimum 77 hours of rest per week not less than that in case for some reason they are breached then additional compensation rest shall also be given to the particular mariner all above shall be in cognizance with the following 
say, uh, sole lookout along with the DRA that is uh, detailed uh, risk assessment only during daylight hours and when the vessel is in open sea conditions and with mild or uh, to no traffic in the vicinity and the lookout helpsman is in sight of duty officer along with the radio communication. Now the idea is that a uh, sole lookout procedure shall be complied with it only in cognizance with the master and upon duty officers uh, you know comfortability but the conditions are detailed risk assessment shall be carried out and there is it should be no traffic or maybe mild traffic and it should be only during the daylight hours and last but not the least the ab or the uh, the, the the person who's uh, going to be rating who's going to be on the bridge watch along with the duty officer shall if he has to do some maintenance work he shall be in physical sight of the duty officer and also in the radio contact with the duty officer that is in case of any emergency if he has to be called upon watch keeper and rating are not in violation of the arts of rest that is another thing which we talked about company and masters bridge standing orders along with the masters daily night orders are read and understood along with the strict adherence and compliance uh, with the company's policy as well large scale charts are in use all navigational equipment and the main engine machinery sp spaces are in good working condition <coughs> du uh, duty officers well familiarized with all nav uh, bridge equipment duty officers aware of the present weather conditions as well as the monitoring of the barometric tendency now when i say bar barometric tendency means if you have a drop of barometric pressure of two millibars or more in span of two hours means 100 percent you're heading for a bad weather so along with all these precautions the duty officer sh should also observe the barometric tendency along with the weather report with the latest weather report be it on egc or spos or any other program you may have in compliance with the environmental protection policies which we already talked about uh, bridge watch keeping checklists are strictly complied with and adhered to during anchorage all uh, the required precautions are taken into account please watch my lecture number 46 47 48 where i have detailed safe anchoring procedures each lecture may be 40 to 50 minutes i have divided them in three parts that is wide lecture number 46 47 48 on my youtube channel under marine quest solutions you see for yourself you'll see i have explained each and every aspect of safe anchoring procedures because today what is happening anchoring has become a critical operation why because of the lack of seamanship and lots of other aspects which i've explained in detail at length in my you on my youtube wide lecture number 46 47 and 48 respectively uh brought uh During pilotage waters with POB, even whilst the master is on the bridge, it does not relieve the duty officer's obligation as far as safety of navigation is concerned. So do bear in mind, <coughs> good old days, only master was, uh, he only had his neck under the noose, but now nobody is spared. If there's a lapse from one, you know, link of the chain, he or she shall also be, or will also be admonished. Now, these are the few <coughs> pictorial things I've taken from MAIB report. The collision of vessel uh, uh, failing to keep a proper lookout. That is, if I take this white patch is sole lookout. This is a sole lookout. And if I take purple, not a sole lookout, not sole lookout watchkeeper. And this blue is don't know. So if I look at this, purple, that means this was not a sole lookout watch. Still the number of collisions daylight this is what it is accounting and at night this is what is uh, uh, the you know collision rate that is the collisions of vessels failing to keep a proper lookout by rule number five and during twilight this is the case this is uh, the percentage so you see uh, that two vessels collided here these are the number of the vessels <coughs> the, but the astonishing point is that even after keeping a lookout still the collisions are at max this is at night time that means the duty officer maybe is in cross into some work and lookout is maybe in, a, in his own i don't know daydreaming or what and the complacency 
falls in and that is the main reason now collision possible factors number one is fatigue which we know work rest hours shall be always com complied to and the percentage accrues towards around almost 25 percent that is work rest hours the rest hours if they are not met fatigue is there yes it can cause a lot of uh, you know drastic aspects i agree but look at the second fact the competency competency because of that the number of possible collisions have risen up to almost say 78 percent so that is what i'm trying to say today because of the complacency over reliance on the electronic aids navigation not having a cognizance or the limitations as far as the electronic aids navigation is concerned lack of seamanship lack of practical knowledge of seamanship all that has accrued to the maximum number of collisions which have taken place are growing to 78 percent now very unfortunately today the level of the mariners has dipped to nada due to the fact of over reliance upon the electronic means of navigation and complete devoid of practical knowledge of seamanship these are the five aspects which have culminated into the incidents and accidents even after having state of the art equipment on the bridge rule 7b now this is just to give you a nutshell on the radars proper use shall be made of radar equipment fitted and operational including the long range scanning to obtain early warning of risk of collision and radar plotting or equivalent i'm sure today not, a, not many mariners would know how to do the radar plotting because it has probably for them maybe it has become obsolete because you have arpa and so many other aids to navigation assumption shall not be made on the basis of scanty radar information especially scanty radar uh, scanty radar information especially sc uh, sc uh, scanty radar information yes okay so here we see the proper use of radar which is carried out by the mariner is only 27 percent and improper use or improper or poor use of radar is 73 percent in other words if we cannot even comply with the basic electronic aids for navigation agdis has so many other complications but radar is simple i've seen it personally myself the duty officer does not know how to tune the radar properly as one of the things which was depicted earlier that you know using rain clutter to maximum without knowing what is the relevance what it may uh, you know culminate into basically suppressing of all the echoes so this is again a rep uh, you know a pictorial uh, pie chart diagram from the maib report that is proper use of radar which has been carried out was 27 percent and improper 73 percent so ladies and gentlemen I hope during this uh, course of lecture I have tried to explain you everything in a detailed manner. If you have any doubt, do let me know. Please do like, subscribe my channel under the banner, uh, banner of Marine Quest Solutions. And also, if you have any doubt, do come back to me. And if you really want me to broadcast uh, a detailed lecture on the ship's maneuvering characteristics, I will. That is only after I finish the sixth part of the passage planning. Because I take a series of it as per the request of my followers. Thank you. Good day. Stay safe. I sign off. Thank you.